Okay, my name is Brenda Solanke, and I'm going to begin by introducing my panel, and I'll save my introduction for later on. Most of you know me anyway. Okay, on my immediate left, they're all to my left. This is Garima, Garima Talvar, and she is Shiv's niece and has been influenced by him and his wonderful philosophies all her life. What a rich, <laughs> rich tradition there. She works on all things related to pension policy and income security matters for the Ministry of Finance. My brain just goes, ouch. <laughs> She holds a Master's of Public Health and is also an avid reader, dancer, and foodie. <laughs> now, Bhav Nabat is my niece, and I've known her since she was born. I know she has lived through some very, very, very challenging times and experiences that not many people have to go through, and she's come through it brilliantly. She's She's a wonderful young woman. She's currently working in Toronto in the field of kitchen design, a very creative, artistic, and immensely practical field. Now, the next gentleman over there, Dave, he's my newly adopted son. We had an encounter at Home Depot. He's been a friend of my daughter's for quite a few years, and I'd met him before, but we had an encounter at Home Depot where he asked me, oh, what are you doing? How are you doing, Brenda? Are things ready for the wedding this summer? And I said, well, I'm here to get X. X didn't actually exist, but I was trying to find it. And he chatted a while, and then he left, and I wandered off to try to find this improbable thingy I needed. And 10 minutes later, who do I see coming down the aisle? But Dave, he said, I just felt I couldn't leave you alone to try to figure this out, and how can I help? He's a gentleman, he's respectful, he's kind, he's sweet, he's my new son. Other aspects of his life, they were relevant. But he was very happy to be able to speak here and he had mentioned that he'd heard of Shin and he was very glad to be able to come here. Now Sham, on the end there, that's Sham Solanke, he's my nephew, who in his words, <clears throat> is the self-proclaimed luckiest person in the world. Loves appreciating and creating art, music, writing. Equally inspired by science, psychology, business, and economics. Grateful husband and humbled father. It's all fun. So as you can see, we have a wonderful group of people here. And I'm really, really thrilled that they've all agreed to talk on our topic of spiritual values, how to live our lives in balance and harmony. Now, this is not as easy as saying that sentence, as all of us are aware of. Living in harmony and in balance can, is an ongoing challenge, at least for me, on a daily basis. Uh, most of us are not in a position to change or make the world a better place on a large scale. Shiv is doing an amazing job of trying to achieve that goal, and I thank you for that, Shiv. No, but not everybody can tackle things that way, so I, when he asked me to do this panel, I thought, I'd like it to be stories from our hearts of how we have lived our lives with our values, which may or may not have evolved or may have come from strange places, but how, how do we live our lives with our values, keeping them intact, when we come up against the negativities of life and the difficulties of dealing with people who don't think like we do at all. So, Garima, you're first. Thanks, Brenda. Um, so, I'd like to start with uh, sort of discussing where these values originated from. And um, I've been lucky enough to have three pillars that I'd identify as really being influential in, in sort of cultivating my value system. Uh, the first is my family, and I've been very lucky to, to have parents um, and siblings and extended family members uh, that are the emulation of love and dedication. And um, my mom and my parents had three kids within one year. Uh, my brother and sister were born a year after I was, they're twins. And so if we can remember what Kumi was talking about uh, yesterday, 
um, that can be very challenging for parents right from the get-go of the, the birth of their three children. And so um, as the eldest, I was also very attuned growing up to what was happening in my family dynamics. Um, my dad worked very hard. Um, the lack of childcare uh, in Canada prevented my mom from going to work, and so she was a stay-at-home mom. And so uh, what I really learned was not only the, the balance in family life, but because my parents aren't particularly religious or spiritual people, um, they often encouraged me to think critically about what I was being told. Um, and so that's one aspect of my life. And then we hit about age five and I start going to public school. Um, so I leave the home, I leave my mom, um, and I'm now exposed to the secular teachings of our public uh, education system. And so growing up through that system, we're exposed to rationality, we're exposed to the, the world of science and to really think about you know, uh, to really um, engage and crit critically assess all of the information that we were that we are being exposed to, and so, and I remember in about uh, grade three or grade four in some history lesson, um, uh, an exclamation mark in in Western uh, civilization was in in England when there is a separation of the church and the state, and um, and really it was impressed upon me that this was a historic moment in the way in which Western civilizations have evolved because we have now taken the crazy part of religion and the dogmatic part of religion outside of what uh, public systems are supposed to be. And that, for me, coming from uh, a Hindu household uh, where you know our culture was very important to, to us, um, this separation was new. Uh, knowing of what my Indian heritage is like, I was very aware that that's not how all systems necessarily worked. And so that, again, was a, a marker in my, in my growing up. And then around, around age seven or eight, uh, multiple worlds collided in my life. I was not only going through school and experiencing all of these things, uh, but I was diagnosed with a very rare illness uh, called diabetes insipidus, where um, it's not necessarily diabetes, but a person uh, is, is relentlessly thirsty and always has to go to the washroom. And after being plugged into to machines at Sick Kids Hospital for about a week, and my mom was next to me the entire time, I just remember hearing about these World Vision stories and thought to myself, wow. What an accident of birth. And we were talking about this yesterday with one of my cousins. Um, if I was born anywhere else, I would have been dead, right? Like really at age seven or eight, really learned that if I did not have access to clean drinking water um, in the town that I do, because let's remember that not all Canadians, uh, not we don't have fresh drinking water everywhere in Canada, but at least in Canada, we have the largest fresh water resources. If I was born to the rest of the half of the world, I don't know if I'd actually be there today. And then I started thinking about the other kids that had, that may have had this illness, but actually died of a diarrheal disease, and instead were checked off as another statistic um, in much of the developing world. And so, again, this was a marker in my life, and and my dad didn't have extended health benefits, so I was very aware of the lack of pharma care in our country and out-of-pocket payments for, for egregiously priced medications. And, and so my mind started paying attention to policy issues um, that are relevant not only to Canadians but the rest of the world. Um, and then it was also at this time that I was exposed to classical Indian arts and I started to learn Parthanatyam. So remember, at around seven and eight, I, I'm learning through this secular system, I've been diagnosed with, with an illness, and now through my Thaiji and Thaiji, I'm exposed to a, a classical Parthanatyam teacher um, who has agreed to take me under her arms and Manikadi sort of raised me for, the, for the, the younger parts of my life. 
Um, and it was through that dance and starting to learn that dance that I found my sense of creation and my sense of divinity. I didn't know what any of this meant. I just knew that when I was dancing, I was happy. Nothing around me might have been great, but I knew at that moment in time I was happy. And that was probably my articulation of, of some sense of awe or energy or God or whatever it is that we want to call it. Um, and so once all these worlds started to blend as I grew up, my family started getting busier and I started to sort of think about how, about how all of this fit into a bigger social political narrative. And, um, and these viewpoints changed as I started to understand that the world was in change. Um, we're often told that today's society is in a period of fundamental change, uh, but I, I knew this from a micro level, knowing that that society will never remain the way that it was just an hour ago. And the only constant that I actually had in my life was dance. And for me, dance, again, is that is an articulation of the divine for me, myself. And so that really helped ground me um, as I was experiencing changes growing up, whether it was going through university, whether it was experiencing um, illnesses and deaths in my family and friends, uh, whatever it is that life normally throws at you, I knew that I had this constant. And, in, and it was through this constant that I learned about Indian traditions, I learned about Hindu traditions, um, and I was, and again, through dance, was very much made aware that I need to be critical about all of the traditions that are sort of uh, thrown upon us growing up. And so I think these things have been very fundamental in, in my growing up. And so now, when we sort of think about, well, how do I exercise all of these things um, in my daily life, I really think back to my current job. So as, as was mentioned previously, I work in, in policy. I work in the world of pension policy and income security, which is a huge matter in terms of the development of what we understand to be the welfare state. But I also hold a background in public health. And so people often say, well, how do you navigate these worlds? And, um, and now with the changing world of the labor market, we're often told, you know, be exposed to lifelong learning. You know, this is the new way of the world. You're no longer going to just go to college and university. And, and at a government level, we're really trying to impress upon people that as the labor market changes, you need to be adaptable to learn. And of course, for somebody like myself that has been exposed to this concept of lifelong learning, though it's not necessarily skills, but rather spiritual learning throughout my entire life, uh, those ideas didn't seem incompatible. It actually seemed to be very related. And so I think this is how, in my work life at least, I sort of think about, you know, while we're thinking about technological change and deunionization and globalization and the, the changing world of the labor market, I'm actually able to exercise what I, I've developed as fundamental markers growing up um, in the way in which I sort of act and behave within my professional life. Um, and I think through a sense of spirituality, I've also accepted that I actually don't know things, right? And I'm always seeking to know more. And, um, and that's very different in a corporate world where you are expected to know, where you are expected to say, I know the answer. In a world where we've got the most data, the most information available to us, uh, we need to be able to say, wait a second, I can't make a decision about this right now. I need to seek to know more. And I think that that for myself is a challenge in a workplace where you're supposed to have a, a bravado, where you're supposed to present yourself as being confident, as the person in the know, the person that's connected and whatnot. And, and managing these worlds is very difficult. Um, and I have to remind myself that it's a journey and that I'm not going to get it perfect every day, nonetheless every hour. And, but I really do think it's this innate understanding that we actually will never know and that the, the whole point is seek to know more is where I exercise some of these spiritual values. Um, my three tricks for navigating these things really quickly is uh, from my, my foundation in the arts. 
I often find, and so yesterday Rory was talking about Sufi music, I often play um, songs, whether it's Sufi music, whether it's Hindi music, and usually it's one of the two, repetitively when I'm doing work. And that's because my work is, my professional work or academic work is an exercise of my own creation, but I need that, that repetition, almost like a mantra, to sort of guide me through it calmly and with a sense of, of devotion. Um, and I also, my second point is to always, um, I mean, I get overwhelmed very quickly, especially in my professional life, and to always remind myself that that I'm actually very insignificant to everything that's happening, right? And so to not let 100 emails a day and, and the white noise pollute the, the core of my work, right? And, and that might happen, it happened on Friday night when I was panicking at 6.30 needing to write an email and I sort of just had to ground myself, breathe for a couple of seconds and remind myself that I'm very insignificant to what's happening in this cosmos and to just, you know, get a grip, basically. And uh, the third is actually always reminding myself of how of how lucky I am and to exercise a sense of gratitude um, and to know that I'm here for a reason now and to really remember that what is in the way is the way. And, um, and those have been fundamental parts of my my growing up. Wow. I just have to repeat the last sentence because it's just so perfect. I remind myself that what's in the way is actually the way. That's, I love that. Bob. Hello, how are you? Um, okay, so in contrast, <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I just wanted to talk about uh, where, I, where I come from. I come from a very strict Hindu upbringing, uh, well not strict so much, but uh, anyway, um, we have, I grew up with like very strong views, very strong viewpoints, very, I guess it's hard to describe, but very Hindu um, upbringing, and uh, so in certain ways where um, like, uh, we were more, uh, we're Gujaratis, so we have a very deep culture, um, and uh, what I mean by that is that uh, we don't eat meat on certain days, or we have to pray to this God on certain days, you know, uh, cook this on this day and that day, and I, I never understood it, but I just went with it. Um, and uh, my grandfather growing up, he's the one who has inspired me to um, be where I am right now, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he always, um, sorry, I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, he he would I can remember him uh, meditating and uh, he went to Shaka uh, every week and uh, looking at old home videos and seeing um, you know he was trying to give us the jewels of knowledge at that time and um, I was not ready to accept the knowledge at that time and I um, I somewhat regret um, not being there but I think it, it there's a reason for everything that there's a reason why I am where I am today. So um, I'm very thankful for where I come from. And there's no mistake that I was born into the family I was. Um, we all, uh, you know, with the strong Hindu aspect of that, um, of our culture, in contrast, we are all spiritual beings in our family. We all have our views and philosophies and they all, they all have the same, same values. So I'm uh, really thankful for that. Um, so uh, I grew up in a very um, abusive family, as in my personal, like my immediate family, where my, my, my father and my mother, they were, they were meant to be together and uh, uh, had to experience um, a lot of physical abuse and, and that sort of thing, not on me, but my mother. And um, never understood why my mother stayed as long as she did. Um, but uh, eventually, um, my mom found this uh, course, this meditation course in Brampton, and uh, I remember driving her to it, and uh, I always thought, you know, I, I really want to do that, um, but uh, it always stuck with me, and uh, soon after, my parents split, and uh, 
and it was so angry. I had so much anger and resentment and didn't know why this was happening. And uh, uh, about uh, three years ago, I, I actually found this same meditation course. Um, and uh, once learning that, once going through that learning process, I realized that there was a reason why my parents split at that time because my mom was going through this spiritual journey with her own self and uh, her vib inner vibration was, was getting higher and, uh, and there was a reason why uh, my father chose to left because he was not at that same vibration and, um, and uh, you know, as karmic, like, we are born into what I believe is we are, we are born into uh, this, uh, reborn into karmic groups Right, so uh, if someone may come into your life and they, um, you know, you might have that karmic settled with them and then all of a sudden they're gone, regardless of who they are, right? Um, so anyway, um, I found Raja Yoga and I, it has changed my life forever. Um, just my whole output, my whole uh, thinking and the way I conduct my life, it, it's just... Uh, apart from all the, you know, the negative things that have happened in my life, and uh, and uh, I've been able to every day live um, and remember that um, I am a soul. I am not this body. I am uh, I'm here to experience in this body. This is a vessel that I have, and uh, um, I'm very thankful for that. So. Um, Yeah, so um, just uh, recently I've, I've gone on this spiritual journey where um, trying to remember every day, as, oh, as I said before, sorry, I'm a little nervous, um, <laughs> um, that we are all pure, peaceful, powerful, virtuous souls, and that we are, um, and uh, yeah, so just to remember, and that's why actually I'm able to look at you all today because I see that you're all souls and, and not these bodies and that we're communicating on a soul level as opposed to um, in this physical form, but uh, yeah. Nervous or not, she, she shared her story well. Maintaining balance for her has been a, a very difficult challenge, and I've seen her do it. It's quite extraordinary. Okay, Dave? Okay, hello. <clears throat> uh, a little background on me, about me. Uh, I grew up just outside of town here, about 10, 15 minutes on a farm, uh, in a nice uh, Christian-minded uh, family. You know, uh, growing up on a farm, you, you have a lot of a lot of challenges and uh, a lot of uh, freedom to, to do as you please out there. And I was uh, really blessed to have that experience. And, uh, and growing up in a Christian home, uh, the teachings of Jesus that gave me that that moral values and, and spirituality like concepts that uh, benefited me. But somewhere along the way of uh, my journey through this life, I've come to realize that maybe not all the aspects of the teachings are, are so true, or, uh, or what is true, I, I don't know. But um, just that I wanted to know what the truth is, because I think there's only one truth. There might be different perspectives of it, but uh, one truth, and so that was my driving force for to where I am today is just uh, trying to understand truth, what is truth, and leaving my ego out of it, like not worrying about if it's uh, contradictory to my beliefs. But I think uh, the only way to have a strong uh, society or system, you need to have a strong foundation, and truth is. Uh, is the only thing that uh, you can truly like, build on, like building on its own rocks. So from there, I, I looked into other religions and uh, spiritual teachings, um, some scientific teachings as well, astrophysics, quantum physics, history, uh, studied yoga, meditation, 
different types of yoga, like kirtans and mantra meditation, breathing, deep breathing exercises, documentaries, YouTube clips, all these things that just, because I grew up in this age of unlimited information before me at the fingertips where you didn't. So I had this mind that just wanted to be fed information. Any questions I had was right there on my fingertips. So I really feel like I was blessed to have that opportunity, the freedom, as I was going to college for three years. I had a lot of free time. And so uh, it was very benefit, beneficial for that. And so some of the concepts that I've developed and that they're now my values are uh, things that, that you would hear in all religions or well, the one uh, similarity in most religions is the golden rule. Right? Treat your neighbor as you would treat yourself or you would like yourself to be treated. And with that in mind and the teachings of quantum physics and uh, energy vibrations as well as other spiritual teachers, uh, the teachings of Abraham, Jerry Nestor Hicks and uh, Dr. Wayne Dwyer. There's a lot, but uh, I'm not going to go into all of them right now. Um, it's just seeing each other as connected, as as the same. Like we're all stemming from source, and we're all from source, and we're all connected. So I've got this ideology that we're all brothers and sisters. From source, and uh, when I look at you, I see my own family. You know, maybe I haven't fully developed that, but that's what I'm trying to to uh, to be and represent on a daily basis. So, some of the things that I do in my daily life to reflect my values uh, would be trying to make a conscious effort at every moment to act in truth. Because quantum physically, all we have is the moment, right? There is no past, there is no future, everything's happening right now. And how do you act in truth? Well, truth is, to me, is source, which is unconditional love, uh, pure, positive energy. And if I'm part of that, that's within me. That's <clears throat> what I want to portray, right? And. Uh, seeing myself and others, right? So, uh, let's see. Um, so one thing that I have done in the past is I've, I ran for the Libertarian Party of Ontario, which is a per, uh, political party, and I'm sure we don't really want to get about, talk about politics here, but uh, the one thing that I um, value about the Libertarian Party, party is their core principles and values for preserving life, preserving liberty, and uh, property. So yeah, as spirit souls, we all have the right to live, to, to enjoy life, to be free from uh, oppression, and, and you know, just treating everybody as equals. Nobody better, nobody worse. And uh, seeing each other from that angle. So that was a, uh, a fun experience. Um, also, another thing I, I do is uh, just walking along the street. I'll, I'll pick up some garbage, you know, just because uh, I love the planet Earth. Like, it's my mother. Like, it's our mother, and uh, I want to see it be clean. I want to. I want to love it and take care of it. And I feel if we're all connected, and if we all did just pick up one piece of garbage a day, you know, we could really make a difference. Uh, another thing I've done is I've volunteered at the Nonviolence Festival the past couple of years, help organizing the, the festival. It's in Victoria Park, and just promoting uh, peace and love and uh, you know communication over uh, violence. Right? I believe communication can resolve all conflicts if we just look at each side of the uh, or each perspective from the individuals. We can work work with them and, and figure out where people may have gone astray or, or help bring to light uh, the, the core problems and that usually you can come to a win-win situation if you have that, that mindset in hand. And also I grew up idolizing people like Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., guys like that. 
Um, another thing I, I do is, uh, like um, one of our panelists here said already, just uh, meditating and just being uh, thankful for being alive sitting in gratitude for, for having the ability to control this amazing body and to be thankful for, for living this, this life and having the sun shine on my face and, and just being in the moment and where I am and thankful for everything that I have. Uh, it's, it's very nice. Um, also, if there's another person who, who Maybe it's not vibrating at the same level as me, and they're they're getting upset, and they might be uh, getting mad at me over some issue with work or whatever. You know, I have the control. Uh, like I can choose not to to allow myself to be affected by their energy, right? Like just because they're not uh, like in harmony with themselves, doesn't mean I have to lower my my emotional state uh, is to be aware of that because, and I know too that it's not me, it's not something I've done, but it's a reflection of themselves, that they're, they're working on something within them, and it's actually, I can also view them as a teacher, helping me see maybe things that I don't have right with myself and how I can better myself. And yeah, it's all very, good stuff to know and to try to do. <laughs> so, yeah, just to wrap things up here, um, as long as, uh, as far as living with others with different values, and, um, I just uh, try to respect all life and, and freedom. And if other people don't view those things as valuable, then I still respect them and love them and see them as a beautiful spirit soul brother, sister, mother, or father, son, or daughter, grandmother, grandfather, um, but maybe they're just uh, out of harmony with source. Yeah, thank you. So I'm gonna keep this short. Um, how can you have a conference about spirituality and there's no kids here? What the heck is that all about? So, allow me to, if you could, stretch your imagination. Like this, this might actually require you to feel a little uncomfortable. Wh who is speaking to you right now is not who you think it is. I'm actually in the body of a 43-year-old, but I'm going to speak to you as if I'm maybe six or seven. Because um, if I was three, I'd just leave. This is too boring. <laughs> um, we all have this sense of belongingness. Kids want to belong. Uh, I want to play. And it's this capillary action. We are all these little drops in an ocean, but we're not just a drop in an ocean, we're the entire ocean in one drop. And we're drawn, I, I can actually feel it in this room right now. Every one of us is here for a very specific reason. If, if you each have your own and you'll if you reflect on it, you'll feel it. This entire game that we play, all of this talking, and you know, I mean, the, the lecture that I heard, you know, before we came in, uh, it, it was brilliant. It was perfect because there's a lot of cold things that we do automatically that we've learned, right? And so my my work in life, my passion in life, is to remind kids. So we can, t we can talk to adults, like grown-ups will hear this and the, you know, they might not do anything because they've got bad habits, but let, let's fix this before it gets bad. Let's talk to kids and remind them that they're already perfect. They don't need to learn a damn thing at all. They're, they're fine, just go out and play, right? All these things like religion and all, you know, all the other stuff that you, know, you grown-ups want to talk about, you created them, we didn't. We just want to play, right? Um, I, I learned all of this actually from my boy. He was playing on the street with his friends and they, you know, the kids were riding their bikes. And I heard some squabbling and then he rode back to the house and I'm sitting up in front watching them play. And I said, hey Vivek, what'd you do? He says, oh, I'm bored, I'm gonna play something else. It, it hit me like a bolt of lightning. I'm playing a game, I don't wanna play this anymore. 
I don't want to be, you know, in the rat race. If I win, I'm still a rat. You know, I don't want to do that. And so I, 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 I played with the idea and I said, okay, well, what is it? What is it that makes me choose one thing or another? And it's, it's all the programming that we've had since we were children. This public education system, when it grades kids, it tells them they're less than something. That's crap. They did something by one person. You know, it, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, they got, and I tell my boys, I don't care if you got a C. You got a C from this one teacher on this one assignment. Don't let that make you think you're less than you are, ever. Don't, don't let it happen. And, and so the, the, the problem, I mean, the damage is done on us, right? Like, we're done. We're finished. <laughs> right? It's, it, we're, that, unless you can speak to the inner child in you and actually give that voice power and say, you matter. What you want is, you know, I'll, I'll do this. I, I'm serious. I, I make, you know, lunch for the kids. I drop them out of school. I come home. I turn on the tunes and I dance, right? I do that while we're getting ready for school. This is a, it's a fun game. My, I had a visualization that at the end of life, God put his arm around me and said, hey kid, did you enjoy that ride? Was it fun? Right? That's it. Like this is, at the end of the game, the king and the pawn go in the same box. It has nothing to do with money. It has nothing to do with money, right? It's, are we having fun? Do we have friends to play with? Do we belong, right? Does someone care about me? All this judgment about, you know, my carbohydrate. What the hell is a carbohydrate? I don't care. I don't want my kids to think, oh, am I eating too many carbohydrates? No, just play, have fun. That's all. <laughs> thank you, Dave, and thank you, Sean. Bhavna and Narima, we've gotten very different perspectives, and yet they're all the same. They're on a journey, they want to make a difference. They're choosing to work in balance and harmony with life as they see it. And what wonderful ways of achieving it, and so different. Um, where's Fred? Doesn't matter. He insisted that I introduce myself. So, here's my introduction. Who is Brenda Solanke? Well, first of all, I'm a wife of that delightful man who's had his camera in, in your face all weekend. And I'm a mother of four. And those have been my main jobs, the main focus of my life. However, I've also been, let me see if I can go down the list here, I did write it out, because I, you know, you talk about young people having, people having to find new careers. Well, I've been doing it since I, forever. I, I've, um, what have I been? I've been a librarian, I've been a teacher, I've been a business owner, a business manager for him, I've been a costume designer, a professional bra maker, a, t uh, a computer specialist, um, all of those things, and I enjoyed them all, but mostly I've been an avid, lifelong seeker, trying to figure out who I am, why am I here, what's my purpose. I have found ways, but those are my ways. We each find our own. I do want to share one little story because it's, for me it sort of encapsulates everything that I've heard in this, these two days. Everything that all the other speakers have said. A few years, well, quite a few years ago, when I first started my own business versus managing Vijay's business, I was associated with a woman who I considered my mentor. Now we heard the word mentor yesterday from Kumi. Well, this woman was not a mentor in the true sense of the word, but that's how I viewed her at that point in my life. She knew more than I did, or I thought she knew more than I did. So I would listen to her, and I was trying to emulate her skills as I built my own business. After a while, I realized there's something wrong with the relationship. It didn't feel right that, that gut was saying, something's wrong here, but at that time in my life, I didn't, hadn't learned to listen to that particular brain. So I continued. And then one evening at, a, at a, a meeting with about 12 colleagues in the business, she started completely tearing apart my business concepts and where I was going and the things I was trying to achieve. I kind of went, whoa. But I didn't know how to respond. 
I was in such shock at this apparent attack that I went into autopilot, <laughs> as we heard this morning, and I, but I said nothing. I, I said nothing. Um, at the coffee break, one of the ladies came up to me and she said, that was rather rude. And I went, yeah, it was a little unexpected. And I, I, didn't, I didn't have a further conversation. I went home and over the next few days, I did what I call spiritual exercise. Um, I don't fancy it up by saying meditation. I really exercise, okay? I do a spiritual <laughs> exercise where I go into contemplation, meditation, prayer, whatever name you want to label it. And I asked, okay, what is really going on here? What is, what is the real problem? It took me quite a few days, but I did finally get the answer. The answer was, I had outgrown this particular mentor. I had to put my own fears aside and become in balance and harmony with myself. I could not be in balance and harmony with this person because her viewpoint was so very different from mine. Now, her perception, as we heard from Dr. Burris this morning, her perception might have been she was just doing everything fine and I'm the one at fault. Doesn't matter. My perception was that relationship was no longer helping me. It was actually toxic. So I had a choice. Do I confront her? That's not my way. I've learned that confronting people just, you know, no matter how justified you feel, no matter how justified the anger, no matter how bad they treated you, it just doesn't go anywhere except to make matters worse. So I detached in the typical dictionary definition. I severed the relationship quietly, peacefully, no anger, and I just stopped dealing with her. Did that mean I was turning my back on her and walking away? No. We still would interact in a pleasant, civilized way, but the relationship was no longer there. I, and did I lose business? No, as a matter of fact, my business took off after that because I had freed myself from restrictions. I had found my own balance and harmony. Now, that's one way, that's one tool I've used, detaching that way. The much more difficult tool is to detach from someone who's hurting you or a relationship that's hurting you or a problem that's hurting you. To detach from it spiritually and still deal with the problem. People who are well, social activists, as, as Garima and I were discussing, how do you be a social activist without being angry? I would suggest that the spiritual tool that they learn to use is detachment. And when you're trying to achieve detachment, it's really tough. So I've got, um, I've got some questions. I've got my own little checklist. When I'm in a situation where I'm with somebody who I sense I'm not in harmony with, or they're not in harmony with me, I ask myself these, these three questions first. Okay, is it true what they're saying or what I'm feeling? Is it true? Is it kind? What I want to say in reply is what I'm saying in reply, true. Is it kind? And thirdly, is it really necessary for me to say this to them? Now, if I can answer yes to all three questions, I proceed with the conversation. If one of those questions, and it's usually, is it kind? Um, when that arises, if the answer is no, I pause and I follow what I call the law of silence. Maybe I won't say anything to that person as I did to my mentor. We had a relationship afterwards that was completely different. Not in her mind. She thought everything was just the same, except I wasn't hanging out as much. Okay? The fourth question, if one of those other questions is no, and the law of silence is not what I want to follow, is what would love do? Now, that form of love is the one where you're, you're listening to the hidden observer, you're listening to the inner voice, you're listening to the divine guidance, however you want to phrase it. What would love do? Fill in the blank, change the word love, change it to God, change it to Krishna, change it to Jesus. And then try to follow those 
concepts as you proceed. None of this is easy, but it makes life worthwhile. I have one little quote I'd like to read here from is it this one. No, it's in here. This is a book by my teacher, Harold Clem, who's the leader, the spiritual leader of an organization called Ekinkar. And he's got these little books of daily quotes and daily inspirations. And there's all kinds of these out on the market. And they're all valuable, valuable tools to, if you want a little meditative seed at the beginning of the day. And what he says here is, what we are aiming for is not to avoid the roller coaster effect of life, but to gain the middle path. This means the path of moderation, the balanced outlook, the spiritual viewpoint that no matter what happens, the sorrows of life will not bury us forever. We know that the divine cause, the divine being, has put us here to learn something. It is up to us to go into life and find out what it is. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful, <clears throat> wonderful panel discussion. Thank you so much. Before we go, I want to turn it up. You, know, you give us hope, <laughs> right? That we haven't messed you up. <laughs> but, um, I'm just going to turn it over. First of all, we're going to cancel. We're going to um, not cancel. We're going to put the mindful session into the plenary session, and Barb's going to handle that. So we've got some time for questions. Uh, any questions for the panel? George, come on up. This ain't no question, but as I look at... George, can I see your face? <laughs> go that way. Go, go that way, go, go. You're looking at the better side. <laughs> I look at your uh, average age. And then I look at Shiv and myself and, and some others. And uh, you, you, you made me want to cry, to be honest with you. Um, I have uh, kids your age and grandkids. And I frequently wonder where they're going and what they'll experience. And uh, you just gladden my heart to know that uh, as Shiv and I move off, that our beliefs kind of go with us, at least from the physical realm, but you all replace it. And uh, maybe there's still tremendous hope for that golden age that's coming. I compliment you. Thank you for being here. The best thing that's happened to the show. Any other questions? <laughs> I actually had I'd be remiss if I didn't, uh, I don't need one for that. The, the one, the one thing, thing that I... Do you want to get in trouble with DJ and oh, Brenda? You, <laughs> you should know better. It wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> yeah, no, I'd be remiss if I didn't... It, a lot of the crap that I said before is incoherent because I'm an angry kid. Um, and... It really is to say, stop being who you think you're supposed to be and start being who you are. You know, a lot of people think, what's your, what's your passion in life? You know, that's crap. That, your passion in life is to be who you are. Just be who you are. That's it. That's it. So stop being who you think you're supposed to be and start being who you are. You don't need permission slips anymore. We're not kids. You know, we're in this field trip of life. You don't need permission slips. It's about post-it notes. Stick a post-it note. Like, this is my dream. This is what I'm after. That's it. Good. Any other questions? Folks, on behalf of us all, folks, give these guys an incredible round. Thank you so much. And thank you, Brenda. Um, and uh, I hope you're sticking around for the rest of the conference and keep us on the straight and narrow, okay? I have, I have a question. Oh, sure, Chef. Now the thing is over. <laughs> I want Give me the mic. guys to present in the next year's conference. <laughs> now, you decide, have a meeting over coffee. <laughs> you decide 
who's going to make, maybe all of you want to make one hour of presentation next year. Presentation's boring, let's play. I don't mean yes. to minimize what you're saying. When, when we all would get into a room and, and share ideas and play, be creative, support each other, you slip into this thing called flow. There's no friction, there's no restriction. We can have an hour of play, absolutely. Let's do it. Absolutely. Whatever you do, I didn't say presentation on what. Okay. It could so, be the presentation of a song and dance, fun? a game to play. Yeah. I'll bring the toys. Well, Shiv, um, as their agent, <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. Play, I would love it. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Let's.